Hi, I'm Lucas. And I'm Brian. And this is the Quacks Podcast. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Quacks Podcast. Hope you're doing well. So today I have a great guest for you. Her name is Esther Joy Vanderwerf, and she is an expert in how to improve your vision. Now, I myself, I have slightly blurry vision and I use glasses, especially for driving at night. So, you know, the topic was of uh, particular particular interest to me. Um, She's written several books on the topic and teaches people how to get rid of their glasses for both nearsightedness and farsightedness. Uh, One heads up, though, about the episode around the 25 minute mark, Esther steps us through a Bates method practice and you have to have your eyes closed uh, during certain parts of it. So if you are driving around, you may want want to listen to that portion of the podcast when you're not driving. Enjoy the interview. Esther, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Lucas. I'm happy to be here. Yes, I am really happy you are here too. We're going to be talking about such an interesting subject, your eyesight and how to make it better. Uh, But before we jump into that, tell us your story, Esther, and tell us how you kind of became interested in this subject. Well, my story is that at age 18, I became nearsighted. And this is the year I was in college. It was the first year of any school that I failed, which was stressful, of course. Um, I was learning to drive, which I found stressful. It didn't come naturally to me. And I was in a relationship that my parents did not approve of. Oh. (laughs) So I had three loads of stress that year. And I guess it got into my eyes and things became blurry And my parents noticed that I was squinting at the television. I couldn't read the subtitles anymore. And um, I just, you know, wasn't doing so well. Hmm. And they sent me to the optometrist and I was measured, you know, my myopia was measured. It was considered mild, but I was given glasses for it. And um, at first I was fairly happy with getting glasses because I thought it would make me look more intelligent. <laughs> and I, I thought it'd be nice to you know, get rid of that little bit of blurriness that the world had. And of course, it is nice to, to get clarity back. But the glasses I found really annoying. I could not get used to them. I found that they, they made me feel separate from the world. Like I was behind this barrier of the glasses Wow. And everybody else was on the other side, and I, I felt left out. <laughs> it was a really odd feeling that I couldn't get used to. And uh, so what happened is that um, I thought it was easier to live in my blurry world than to wear the glasses and, and live separate from everybody and hmm. everything. So I just cunningly lost my glasses to the dismay of my parents who paid for them. And went into the world with this blurry vision and like, you know, I see well enough. I can squint and get by. It was, well, that was my solution. If you just squint, you can just see well enough. And so I managed to cheat a little bit and pass my driver's test, the, the vision part of my driver's test and got my license. And, um, you know, life went on and I, I didn't find that blurry vision somewhat annoying. And at some point... I read a a newspaper article about a method that said you could improve your eyesight. And that intrigued me. And I decided, oh, I'll I'll get the book that they were talking about. I did. And it was all, maybe I misunderstood it at the time. I I don't even remember which book it was now because I've, I've since then got so many of them. But whichever book that was, my impression of it was that you had to do eye exercises, like move your eyes on purpose, left, right, left, right, up, down, diagonals, circles, circles the other way, near, Mm. far, near, far, all that sort of, you know, eye push up kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I tried that. I remember doing that. I remember tying a um, a rope to a doorknob and, and put a few knots in it and you would have to put one end of the rope near your nose and the other end is on the doorknob. You pull it taut and then you go from one knot to the other and back and forth to the doorknob and to your nose. And anyway, you had to spend so many minutes a day doing that and it didn't work. <laughs> and uh, it was terribly boring. And after a few weeks of doing that, I was like, Ugh. <laughs> I, I, I gave imagine. up. I gave up. And I was like, this doesn't work. Um, and it was called the Bates method. 
So my conclusion was the Bates method is eye exercises and eye exercises don't work. So the Bates method doesn't work. And, um, and this was in my hmm, mid-20s, around 25, 26 or so. And then another uh, six, seven, eight years later, I don't remember exactly, somewhere in my early 30s, I came across the Bates method again. And this was another author, another book. And the author was actually at this expo that I uh, attended. And I asked him with my skeptical mind and saying, hey, yeah. Uh, I've tried this once before. Yeah, do you think this really works? <laughs> That's, of course, a stupid question to ask an author. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, nope, nope, don't buy the book. Yeah, exactly. What's he going to say? <laughs> so his answer actually intrigued me because he said, well, um, it's not about eye exercises. It's about how you use your eyes all day long. And, and so his book, he's, he claimed, was not about eye exercises, but about how to use your eyes. And that, that I found intriguing and interesting enough to say, okay, I will buy this book and I'll give it another go. And um, so I did. I bought it. And then several months later, I finally got the motivation and the time to read it. And it took me about two weeks to read that book. It was called Relearning to See by Thomas Quackenbush. Hmm. And... Um, after the two weeks, I was back at 2020 vision, 100% acuity. Wow. And that stunned me. <laughs> I, I hadn't expected to improve. I had only hoped to stay at the blurry level I was at because I didn't think you could improve. So I was really just doing it not to get any worse. And instead, I improved. <laughs> and that surprised me a lot. So then I tested it out on uh, my boyfriend at that time who was wearing glasses for myopia that were much stronger than I had ever worn. And he was like minus four. He had some astigmatism as well. He used his glasses all day long. And I asked him if he would take his glasses off for one week and and try this out with me okay <laughs> now as you can imagine with strong myopia if, if you take off your glasses it, everything is extremely blurry and functioning becomes kind of a challenge yeah that doesn't work so he hesitated <laughs> and uh i said well look don't worry if we have to drive anywhere i'll do the driving you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> and he hesitantly agreed and gave me his glasses so i hid those make sure he wouldn't cheat and um, for that one week, we just, you know, practiced what we learned from the book. And at the beginning of the week, I put him in front of the eye chart that came with the book, measured out the 20 feet and says, okay, you stand here, tell me, you know, what you can see. And he stands and peers in the direction of the eye chart. And he's like, did you hang something on the wall? Hmm. <laughs> and he didn't even see it. He couldn't read the top letter. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was really blind, wasn't he? Not blind, but strong enough nearsighted that he couldn't read the top letter from 20 feet away. And um, I, I always say ignorance is bliss because I didn't know at the time that, you know, that's kind of a, a tough case to improve. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I didn't know that. So in my beautiful innocence, I said, well, it doesn't matter. We'll just get going with what's in the book and see how you do. So we did that for a week. And after that week, to my huge surprise, he did not ask for his glasses back. And he, he said it seemed like things were getting a little easier. So we kept going. And it was about a month later when I finally checked his eyesight again with that same eye chart, same distance, same room. And he could read the top four lines and and was about to read one extra line i'm like wow you you know you're only one line away from passing the driver's test and <laughs> without glasses and wow. and so he went in one month from not seeing the chart to just about being ready to pass the driver's test without glasses and and that amazed me way more than an, my own improvement amazed me so yeah it's hard to believe that, yeah, yeah, it is. And, and of course, he's my very first student. I knew nothing about anything, really, other than what I had just read from the book. And so this, this was amazing. And I ended up writing a thank you note to uh, Thomas Quackenbush, the author. And he then promptly invited me to come to teacher training. 
And so I didn't have anything better to do. I had sort of semi-retired for a little while and uh, hmm. decided to, to go fly to, back to San Francisco and take that teacher training course. And this was in the summer of 2000, so that's now 20 years ago. And uh, yeah, it changed my life around. It, it became my passion. It became my profession. This is what I do full time, helping people get out of glasses and back to seeing clearly. That is an amazing story. I mean, it's almost hard to believe that he would have that much improvement in a month. Um, yeah. But do these methods, do they help with just myopia, meaning, you know, long distance is blurry, or can they help other eye problems too? Well, for, for me and my boyfriend, we both just had myopia, although uh, he also had some astigmatism with it. Um, and when Dr. Bates, the originator of this method, when he first developed it, he thought originally that it was just for myopia. And later on, as he applied it kind of sometimes accidentally to other things, he found that just about everything, all functional eye problems um, reacted positively to this relaxation method that he developed. And uh, so it's not just myopia, it's also hyperopia, it's presbyopia, it's astigmatism, it's cross eye problems lazy eye problems. And then later on, um, Dr. Bates had a, a student or a patient, he was a doctor, so he calls them patients. For me, they're, they're students um, because I'm not a doctor. But his patient had myopia in one eye and a cataract in the other eye. And Dr. Bates felt he couldn't really do much for the cataract, but he could help stabilize or improve the myopia in the better eye. So that's what they worked on. And to their surprise, the cataract disappeared in the process of working on the myopia. So, you know, it, it's, it can even extend to problems that are beyond what you would expect to be functional vision problems. So, and and that, you know, that was quite a revelation to him. And he kept applying it to all his patients and found that, that lots of problems, lots of eye diseases even, responded quite well to his methods. Hmm. So you mentioned Dr. Bates, and I've heard of him before, and I've heard he's kind of controversial. So who is he, and, and why does he kind of have this cloud of controversy around him? Right, yeah. Well, Dr. Bates was um, an ophthalmologist, an eye surgeon, uh, trained in New York City. And this is he was born 1860, and I think his training was 1885, thereabouts. And... In the late 1800s, 1890, early, early 1890s, he started figuring this out. And at that time, Dr. Helmholtz, a German ophthalmologist, was still alive. And Dr. Helmholtz was the guy who came up with the theory that eyesight cannot be improved, really. And, and that the, the lens, uh, especially with presbyopia, at, at a certain age, the lens gets harder. There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, and when with myopia, when an eye grows longer, that's something that you've inherited. There's nothing you can do about that. This, this was what was believed to be true. And Helmholtz was kind of the grandfather of ophthalmology. And here comes this young upstart, Dr. Bates. And he says, um, no, 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 no. Helmholtz appears to be wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Bates is only fresh out of college, basically, when he starts making these claims. And so he, he gets dismissed initially hmm. as, as being, you know, the heretic, that's, uh, the quack, the, you know, the weirdo, <laughs> gets laughed at. But his methods do work. And, and so as he develops it more and more and gets better at, at explaining it and teaching it, he has huge successes. And then he starts writing about it in 1919, First of all, he, he writes medical articles about it and tries to convince his peers of, you know, of this method and basically gets met with rejection. So then he starts writing magazines for the general public, a magazine called Better Eyesight. And the first issue is in July 1919. And that magazine ran for 11 years um, every month. And became quite popular. And in 1920, he added his own book called Perfect Sight Without Glasses and explained his methods in there. And that became a popular book. So he became well known, but 
his colleagues still prefer to say, it's got to be a quack. This can't be true. It goes totally against what Dr. Helmholtz said. And one of the problems with Bates's claims was that Bates claimed that the ciliary muscle, which is a, a, um, a circular muscle, ring muscle that goes around the lens, hmm. he claimed that this little muscle had nothing to do with focusing, whereas Helmholtz said that was everything about focusing was in the ciliary muscle. So they were on very opposite ends. One said focusing is all done by the ciliary muscle, and the other said, no, the ciliary muscle does none of it. It's the other muscles of the eyes, <laughs> right? So, and it turns out the truth is in the middle, right? The, the ciliary muscle is involved, but not to the extent that Helmholtz said. So, you know, the fact that Bates choose to completely dismiss the action of the ciliary muscle didn't help his case, unfortunately. Hmm. But that doesn't mean the method didn't work. <laughs> the proof was in the pudding, and everybody that went to see him had huge improvements and, and loved what he was doing. And, and the method, after Bates died in 1931, the method survived because his patients carried it on and passed it on to other people. And, and one of the people he taught it to was a woman in Los Angeles, Margaret Corbett, who um, did a teacher training with Dr. Bates. And she set up a school in Los Angeles and, and became very well known and successful. Successful enough that in the 1940s, she got taken to court hmm. for practicing medicine without a license because she was not an eye doctor. She was just doing what Dr. Bates had taught her. And um, amazingly, she got lots of her students to testify for her and she won her case. And so, um, the, the optometry board wasn't too happy about that and decided to try and, and get a law in, into the California le leg legislature, leg what's the yeah. word there? Legislature. <laughs> legislature, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, he tried to get this law into the, the, the California legislature to prohibit the Bates method being taught by anybody who was not a medical doctor. And Margaret Corbett fought that case and won that too, which meant you know, the right to teach the base method uh, continued. And, and anybody who knows the method well enough to pass it on, whether they're a doctor or not, can teach this method, at least within the, within the state of California. And it, so the method survived. And even though, in general, doctors don't believe much in it, there are now plenty of doctors who do. I, I go to conferences on a regular basis and there's always ophthalmologists there. There's always optometrists there who love what Bates did and who figured out, you know, the good parts of it and the, and the negative parts of it and, and don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, but embrace the, the things that work. Yeah. And so the method is still continuing and it's still helping many, many, many people and, Unfortunately, it's it's not hugely well known. That's that's the only downside to it. So mostly people still go to a op regular optometrist and get a pair of glasses when they have issues because um, they just simply don't realize there is another option. So you said earlier that the Bates method wasn't eye exercises. Uh, so what does it entail? Well, uh, at first I thought it did, because that's that was my understanding for the first book I read. But it turns out that Dr. Bates actually, as I started reading all his materials, he never used the word eye exercises. He actually purposely steered away from them. And um, he felt that what he was doing wasn't making the eyes do push-ups. It wasn't make, giving them a workout, because he felt that eye strain, tension on the muscles of the eyes was the problem. And you're not going to want to do exercises on top of muscles that are strained. The first thing to do is teach them how to release that strain, how to relax out of it. And then once they're relaxed, they can learn to be used in a, in a way that nature intended. And, and once you get that, once you realize that it's strain that's the problem, and you release that strain and then start using them in a relaxed way so they can naturally focus as they were meant to without conscious effort, then it works beautifully. Interesting. So it's really about relaxation and tension? 
Yes, it is. It's, it's learning to recognize the tension that you have, figuring out how to release it, and then h- learning how to use your eyes in a relaxed way all day long. That's the basics of the Bates method. Okay. And so would he say that blurry vision basically comes from tension? I mean, is that kind of the root cause? Yes, that's what he always said. Blurry vision is mainly eye strain and mental strain. So he felt like a mental strain um, would come before the physical strain. And so his work wasn't just to release the physical strain of the eye muscles, but also the, the thought pattern that had caused the physical strain. Interesting. So, I mean, one thing I remember reading about was uh, how basically close-up work, uh, you know, the more close-up work you do, the worse your vision. And I think this was, it was like a chart from the 1800s or something, and it looked at uh, glasses and their use by different professions. And, you know, for a librarian, glasses were super high, but for a blacksmith, it was like, you know, a couple here and there. And and the whole idea was that, you know, the more close-up work you do, the worse your vision. So how would that kind of fit in with this? That basically close-up work is causing the tension? Um, I, I would say yes and no. I have seen research that's much more recent than that, that actually shows um, when they tried to figure out the cause of myopia in young children, and this was a study done in Australia and another one in Singapore, I believe, where they found out that the kids, out of this large group of kids that they studied, um, the ones that became myopic did approximately the same amount of reading as the ones that didn't. Hmm. So they felt like the amount of reading wasn't the problem, but the actual most significant factor in creating the myopia was the amount of time that the kids spend outside in natural light. So the kids that were three hours or more per day on average outside had next to no chance of developing myopia, Whereas those that only spent two hours or less, like only one hour a day outside, had a much higher chance of developing myopia. So it, it's not, he, he felt it wasn't so much the, um, the reading, because you can read with strain and you can read without strain, right? Mm. And, and, and there's a difference. So, but the actual amount of time outdoors was way more significant. And, and I think there's more truth in that than in reading being the cause of the problem. And do you know why that was? Is it something to do with light hitting the eye or what is it? Uh, I think it's both the, the level of light, um, because indoors you never get to the same brightness as outdoor sunlight provides. Mm-hmm. It's also the fact that when you are outdoors, how far, far away do you tend to look, right? How often do you glance at the horizon that's more than just 10 feet away, like indoors, right? Mm. You know, indoors, your room might be 10, 15, 20 feet long, but it doesn't extend a huge amount more than that, typically. So your indoor vision is limited to maybe 20 feet. Outdoors, that doesn't happen. So as you're playing as a child outdoors, how often do you glance 100 feet away or more into the horizon or to the clouds or birds fly through the sky? How much more motion do the kids get that are out, outside? So it's a combination of things. It's natural sunlight, the brightness of the light that helps, the, uh, the activities, the, the being active and in motion, and the opportunity to look at great distances on a regular basis. So if you combine those things, it helps the eyes stay healthy, able to relax at at the distance, and you don't get that indoors. Okay. So a lot of indoor time will need to be balanced out with plenty of outdoor time if you want to avoid myopia in children. Speaking of kids, can they use these methods? Yes, absolutely. Any any child, any age. Of course, you know, with babies, <laughs> it's a little different. You can't logically talk to them and say, hey, you know, you need to blink a little more. <laughs> um, but uh, there are methods you can use. You, the mother can swing a baby in her arms, take it outside more, um, you know, play with colorful things. There's a lot you can do even with babies. Um, but as the child gets older and, you know, once they get to age eight or so, they have a great understanding of the same things we understand as adults if you just put it in simpler language. And I find that from seven, eight years old, they can take on this method and, and run with it. When you explain to them it's all playful, relaxing, don't try so hard, 
the less you try, the better you'll see. They get it, and they, they can do really well. Can you give us maybe one or two things that maybe people could try that might show them that this maybe works for them or not? Yeah, yeah, of course. So if you're listening to this right now and you're wearing glasses, then I invite you to just take your glasses off for a moment. And uh, if you're wearing contact lenses, you know, this is recorded so you can come back to it later. <laughs> Go take out your contacts and <laughs> pause this and come back. Um, and, and then as you're looking around with your naked eyes, as one of my colleagues would call it, um, notice what do you see, what's easy to see, where is your problem. So if, if you are um, myopic, you'll find that anything close to you is easy. There's, you know, for most myopes, nearsighted people, they find that anything a certain distance from the eyes is actually totally clear. They have perfect vision close to their eyes. And then at some point, it begins to blur, depending on the level of their myopia. So what I want you to do if you're myopic and you've just taken your glasses off is find where do you have your perfect clarity. You know, pick up some text or pick up a photo, anything you like to look at, and hold it where it's perfectly clear. And then a little further out and notice where it begins to blur. And the other way around, if, if you have problems with near vision in your hyperopic or, or presbyopic, then your distance vision is generally better. Look at something further away, maybe go outside and, and enjoy you know, lush greenery if you have that. And then find, okay, where is it when I get closer to things nearer to me, where is it that the blurriness starts? What, where do I have problems? And then find something that's just slightly blurry, but enjoyable to look at. And then just close your eyes. Just close them and check in with yourself. Check your posture, check your neck specifically, because neck tension really affects the eyes. So if you are in a slouched position and your neck is leaning to one side, that's not going to help your eyes. So check, am I in a nice tall posture? Is my neck relaxed? Is my head balanced on top of my neck? Am I feeling comfortable? Am I breathing okay? How do my eyes feel? How does my face feel? Do I have tension in my jaw? Can I let that go? Right? And then just as you sort of check in all these areas and say, okay, uh, here's Esther telling me to relax. Where do I feel tense? What can I let go of? And how can I just say, okay, relax for a moment. Let go of all the worries. Let go of, of all the to-do list items that are waiting for a moment. Say, okay, it'll come later. Because when you come back to it later, you come back to it in a more relaxed way. You're going to be more effective at dealing with whatever you need to deal with. So just enjoy this little time for yourself. Release, release. Know that any effort you do, any trying you do to see better is only going to make things worse. So might as well stop trying. We're going to just receive in a moment. So with your eyes closed and having checked and released most everything, now let them flash open, but just briefly, just sort of like the opposite of a blink. You just let them open all the way and then quickly close again without making any effort to see anything. So as you open them for that brief moment, light will come in. And surprisingly, you'll find that it's like a picture goes to the back of your brain and you didn't have the time to even try to see, right? You just had your eyes open for a brief moment, but a picture came to your brain. So the fact that this picture came in actually proves you don't have to try hard to see because before you even get a chance to try, the picture is already there. So I want you to be aware that vision is actually very receptive. It's not something you do. It basically is just light that you receive. And that's the key to the whole vision approach. If you see vision as something you receive, rather than something you do, you're already a big step in the right direction. So do that again. If you just let your eyes open for a moment in a different direction, receive a few things, and then close again, relax, and repeat that a few times. And then gradually let your eyes be open a little bit longer and a little bit longer and shorter times closing. You know, so you go gradually from long time closing and very short opening to sort of a you know, couple of seconds of closing and half a second or one second of open and slowly that changes around and then you end up looking around in this receptive way 
with a little bit of blinking here and there, right? Your eyes just close for a moment to come back to that rest and then you open again and receive light. So then in that way, look at this item that was slightly blurry in this receptive way, just noticing it. Don't look at it too long, not staring at it because staring tends to make things worse. So look at a part of it, a detail of it, a different detail, look away from it, come back to it. And notice if you look in that way, how it changes. And that's, that's one way of helping yourself to release the tension and start improving your eyesight. Wow, that's kind of wild. I actually think, like I was doing it while you were talking, and I actually think my vision is a little clear. I, I have, you know, 20, 50 or so, uh, so very slight blurriness, but that is wild. <laughs> well, 2050 is exactly what I had when I started. So you could improve in just two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I might have to give this you, a real shot. Yes, it's so worth it. I mean, have two weeks of relaxation of your eyes can then result in the rest of your life having clear vision like it does for me. Then why why isn't that worth a shot? So is th- And right now we're in lockdown everywhere in the world. So this is the perfect time to try this. Right? Yeah. So is that basically the Bates method or are there a lot of other parts to it? Oh, there's a lot of other parts to it, but this is the the foundation of it, to be very receptive about what you see rather than trying with effort to improve what you see or to peer at what you see, because that will never work. You can, you know, and you can prove that to yourself too. Look at a letter on an eye chart that's slightly blurry and stare at it and try hard to clear it up and you'll find that Hmm. it gets more blurry instead. Hmm. (laughs) So it's easy to prove to yourself that effort makes it worse, whereas relaxation makes it better. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you one question about, because there's other methods to improve your vision online. Uh, And I saw a few years ago, there was a guy who improved his vision by basically using reading glasses. And he would uh, do this thing, and I can't remember the the name of it, but it was like pushing text or or blur pushing or something like that. And basically, Mm -hmm. he would use reading glasses when he didn't need them. He was myopic, uh, so he could see close up fine. But then he would read and kind of read the book at a slight distance so that it was just a little blurry, so that his eyes were always reading something just a little blurry. And, And he said that he had, you know, improved his vision. It took him quite a while. It took him years, I think, of doing this. And and he had to read quite a bit every day. Um, so, I mean, what do you think of that method? Is is that a, is that true or, or? Dr. Bates actually tried this. It's it's a plus lens theory is, is one of the names for it, where for myopia, where you normally would require a minus lens, you do the opposite and use a pair of reading glasses, which are plus lenses. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you're asking the eye for the, the opposite um, curvature, so to speak, to, to see if it will react favorably. Now, Dr. Bates, when he tried it, he says, mm, yeah, there is a temporary improvement, but it doesn't last. And so he let, let it go and said, you know, that's, that's not worth it. And like, like this guy's saying, he's worked on this for years. Um, he probably could have done it a lot quicker had he used Dr. Bates's relaxation methods. That, that's my impression of this plus lens method, that it, it has temporary results. It doesn't last. And if, if you do work on it as much as this one person is, then yeah, eventually maybe you'll have some result, but it takes a huge long time. And, and how many people are motivated to put that much time in? Um, I don't think it's a very effective method. Yeah. I think you're much better off doing the relaxation technique and, and getting at the root of the problem in a much better way. So one of the things that uh, I saw on your website was you mentioned using a projector instead of a computer screen, which was totally amazing to me because I discovered this health trick last year sometime and it has just massively improved my energy levels, my eye strain, and just, just my general overall well-being. Um, and mm-hmm. I thought I was the only one who had figured it out, but apparently... <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you were last year. <laughs> so can you, can you talk a little bit about what staring at a computer screen kind of does to your eyes? Uh, Well, the problem with the computer screen, the main problem is that you're looking into pixels of light and our eyes aren't designed for that. We're designed to look at reflected light 
not directly into the light. Like we're not very comfortable looking directly into sunlight or into bright lamps. It's just not, you know, a good thing to do long term. So even though the screen isn't hugely bright, you're still looking into these pixels of light and your brain has a hard time deciding with its with being pixels of light, where is the actual focal distance of what I'm looking at? Hmm. You know, where is the source of this little light thing? How deep into the screen do I need to look to focus? So what happens is that people with uh, slight problems find that their eyes will go uh, in and out of focus on a screen. And so you get this sort of um, this, this zooming in and out that your eyes are going to do, a slight zooming in and out similar to what a, an autofocus camera would do if it doesn't have enough light to focus correctly. It'll go z -z 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 back and forth, mm -hmm. right? And your eyes are doing this on the screen if they aren't relaxed and healthy. So if you have a slight problem and you're using a computer screen a lot, you're going to invite this, this extremely tiring backwards, forwards zooming that your eyes are going to do. And um, there is lots of solutions for that. Um, you can you know, just be more aware of your peripheral vision because as you open your awareness to your peripheral vision, your um, peripheral vision gives the reference points to your brain as to where in space your screen is, right? Hmm. So that's going to help because people that are on a computer a lot tend to tunnel down into that, you know, small, narrow screen area and they ignore everything else around them. And that's very unhealthy and a stress on the eyes. So open back up, let the whole world come in, the whole office, room, whatever it is where you're at, and notice how that changes the strain on your eyes. And you can use um, computer software to remind yourself to take breaks. Um, on a PC, I use iLeo. Um, iLeo, every 10 minutes, pops up a little screen that says, take a little break for your eyes. And every hour, it'll say, take five minutes and go away from the screen completely. Do something else. <laughs> and, you know, that might be a little annoying if you're in the middle of something, but it's actually a very healthy thing to do, to take those five minutes, disconnect from the, the internet and, and the screen and say, okay, I'm going to go outside for five minutes and give my eyes the rest of greater distance, natural reflected light and then come back and with more rested eyes, resume what I was doing and find, hey, this is going easier, quicker because my eyes are rested. So if somebody, you know, a part of their job, they look at a screen all day, is the Bates method going to help them? Or is it kind of like, I don't know, shoveling snow in a Minnesota, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right. Shoveling sand in the Sahara. You, yes, yeah. You, you, you're trying to say that if you're going to do as much tension work, then there's no amount of relaxation work that can offset that. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. I think you can. Because as your eyes learn to release the tension, they see better. They want to be in that state. And they learn to keep that state, even though they're working in things that are a little more challenging. So you can learn to be more relaxed with a computer. And there are plenty of computer operators who have excellent vision. So, you know, just uh, even computer programmers that this is their work. So look at the screen all day long. Not all of them have glasses or contacts. So it's possible to deal with the screen in a much more relaxed way. And you just have to be a little persistent about applying that relaxation over and over again. Give yourself plenty of rest in the beginning, close your eyes often, try again. And as soon as you feel the tension come back in, close your eyes and say, nope, I refuse to go into that strain pattern. I'm going to do this in a more relaxed way. And you'll build a new habit and it's going to pay off. So Esther, will a projector help with that relaxation? Yes, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that up. You mentioned that you actually have one. Um, I do. When you use, yeah, so when you use a projector, you're eliminating this looking into pixels of light. Now you're looking at reflected light from the projector. And that's a ton more restful for your eyes. And, and you've experienced that. So maybe you can share some of your experience. 
Yeah. So, I mean, the one I bought was this Go D uh, projector, and I think I paid like 150 bucks for it. And it's it's nothing special. Um, as an aside, the interesting thing about projectors right now is that within the next, you know, five to 10 years, projector technology is going to explode. And so we're going to be able to have, you know, the, the projectors today that cost thousands of dollars, we're going to be able to have that power kind of uh, at a very low price point, and, and you're going to be able to maybe even hold the projector in your hand, um, which, which I think is awesome. Uh, but when I started using a projector, uh, when I, when I use a screen, I would look at the screen and after about an hour or two, I would just start to feel off. I mean, it, it wasn't like my eyes got super tired, but I just started to feel off. And like whatever motivation I was feeling to, to keep doing what I was doing, I, it would just kind of start to go away. And the longer I use it, the more down and the more tired and the more kind of strung out I would feel. And since moving to a projector, it's been like night and day. It's like I can I can just stare at this thing all day long and it's it's no problem. I can read on it. I can I mean it just it really opened things up whereas I was kind of moving towards a life where I was maybe on the computer only an hour or two per day. Now I can be on the computer for, for much longer. So I mean that's that's been my experience with it. Yes, and and so you get a, a projector that because I um, I was advised to get one by a friend, and and I bought that one, and I found it was a low quality image. So I ended up not using it, returning it, and I'm looking at what to get instead. So I, I hear that you've you've got to look for a good contrast ratio. Is that something you looked for, or was it the light, the the intensity of the light that you looked for, or was it just the price range? Yeah, I mean, it was the price range. It was it was uh, an outdoor projector too, so I think that does help with the light. But I also think you need a big enough space. So I have a projector set up on one of the walls, and it's shining on another wall that's easily ten to fifteen feet away. And so the actual uh, you know projected image is probably I don't know six or seven feet by five feet. So, I mean, it's yeah. it's really big compared to a computer screen. And so, I, I imagine if you were sitting at a desk, I mean, it would be pretty difficult. And, and what I did is I just, I used a USB uh, extension cable for my mouse and my keyboard. And I, I'm, you know, I'm working way back from this wall. Um, and so, yeah, it, it works fantastically. Great. And I love that you've got that experience. And uh, I'm looking forward to creating that for myself too. Because I've been on the computer way too much and I have that issue of, you know what, it's it's not happy for my eyes either. Even though I'm using the computer consciously, you know, with awareness of peripheral vision, with awareness of motion, with blinking. And still I'm going, you know, there's only so much my eyes want to do on a computer. <laughs> yeah, if you so, can if you can fit in a projector, it will it will change change your yeah. world. Yeah, so great. Let's. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. I have it on my website. I recommended it in my book, but because my own experience was with a bad projector, I just you know I gave up for a little while. But I'm gonna go get back into it. Thanks for remotivating me. So one of the, one of the things I've had since I was a teenager is floaters. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything you can do for those? And what are they? Okay. Uh, well, if I go to the what are they question first, it doesn't seem like there's a totally clear answer on that <laughs> okay <laughs> so some think that it's um piece, pieces of protein floating in the vitreous humor behind your lens um and that may or may not be true i don't know um dr bates thought they were imagined they weren't real um, really <laughs> yes <laughs> that's what he wrote he says you know they're, they're just in your mind they're not actually there um i think the the something in the the lens or it's not in the lens sorry in the vitreous humor behind the lens is more likely but in my experience i've had them myself in the past and i've had plenty of students with them in my experience floaters disappear very quickly as a happy side effect of using the bates method and learning to relax how you see it's one of the first things that goes away and, and I think the reason is that as you learn to release the strain that you've used to see, as you let go of that, circulation improves. That includes circulation of the liquid that goes in and out of the vitreous humor. And as that circulation happens, whatever these little particles are, get washed out. 
Wow. So, you know, I find people, even um, there was one woman in a class in Los Angeles years ago. It, this was a group class. It wasn't one-on-one. I do mostly one-on-one. But in this group class, there was a woman who had floaters, and I didn't even know it. She hadn't told me that. And um, a couple of hours into the class, she suddenly explained, I'm sorry, she suddenly exclaimed that, hey, my floaters are gone. <laughs> I'm totally happy, and, you know. And, and it was like just a few hours, and we hadn't even talked about floaters. We'd only talked about relaxation. And as she relaxed, she found that, you know, she could look at the ceiling or any bright area, and there was no floaters interfering with that. Hmm. And so I, I think uh, whatever they are, they disappear with better circulation that comes from the relaxing that, that the Bates method creates. Okay. So most people these days also wear sunglasses. Um, I stopped wearing them a while ago when I noticed I was getting really sensitive to light. Should we be wearing sunglasses? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the beautiful $100 question, right? Yeah. Or the million dollar question these days. For sure. Um, it's a question I get a lot, obviously. And like you, I used to wear sunglasses and then found that because of the sunglasses, I was getting sensitive to light. And I had never been sensitive to light and I had only started wearing the sunglasses because they were kind of, you know, the cool thing to do. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they, they make you look good. And Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I got a pair of these fancy Ray-Ban sunglasses, neutral gray, because I felt like, you know, I was already into healthy things. And I felt that if I'd got the neutral gray sunglasses, then I wouldn't change the colors that I was looking at. And therefore, they would be just fine. Well, they weren't just fine. They, they caused... For me to, um, to I, I would use the sunglasses as I was sailing. I sailed a lot in those days. I was a sailing instructor at the time. So I would use them every weekend on the boat. And then I noticed this one weekend as I drove home from the harbor back to my house um, that, one, the sky was overcast. Two, I was wearing my sunglasses. And three, the people in the car with me, the friends that I was driving home with, none of them were wearing sunglasses. So I realized, oh, I obviously don't need them. And I took them off. <laughs> and the moment I took them off, my eyes reacted with this, oh, no, way too bright. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to put them back on. And I was like, this is weird. Nobody else in the car needs them. It's overcast. Why would my eyes resist being without sunglasses? So that's when I realized for myself they weren't good and I weaned myself off. And it was very easy to do because I hadn't been using them all that much. Well, these days, um, doctors tell you to wear sunglasses because sure. UV is so dangerous for your eyes. <laughs> and if you have cataracts, well, you must wear sunglasses and not just a regular pair of sunglasses, but you should ideally get those wraparounds so there's absolutely no sunlight that can get to your eyes. So a lot of fear is being projected about sunlight and having to protect your eyes and having to use the sunglasses. And, and if you listen to that and you follow that advice, you'll find that you need darker and darker glasses. And at some point, and, and some of my students get to that point, you find that you're wearing sunglasses indoors. And... And, you, you know, you become extremely sensitive to light. And this is going to limit your life, right? If, if you can't have the curtains open because it's too bright. And, and what you're doing is you're just creating worse and worse and worse of a problem with light sensitivity. And that can go a long ways and really become debilitating. So when I get people at that level, I have to really transition them carefully and slowly but most people are not yet that far down the road and they'll find that either using the sunglasses less only in the middle of the day or in very bright situations will help them, you know, become more uh, desensitized to the light and be more comfortable again. But what you can really do is, is to help yourself get more comfortable is to purposely go out without sunglasses and maybe early in the morning when the sun isn't very high yet or later in the afternoon before it sets. Um, so when the light isn't too bright and then go just sit in the sun, face the sun with your eyes closed and move your head side to side. 
And as you move your head side to side, it'll if you if you let it, it'll appear like the sun is swinging through the sky. So as your head moves to the left, you could you know focus on the position of the sun in the sky and it's now towards your right it's more on your right eye and if you move your head to the right then the sun swings over to your left eye and so if you pay attention to where the sun is as you move your head side to side then you'll get the sun swing happening and it's a very pleasant relaxing experience it takes away attention from your eyes but your eyes are getting a pretty high dose of light at the same time. But you're relaxed about it. You're not squinting against it. You're just noticing the movement of the sun through the sky. And so if you do that for a couple of minutes every day, you'll find that eventually it's like, oh, this is real nice. This is easy. And when you open your eyes and you look away from the sun, they won't feel quite so sensitive to the light. And, and there's more to it. There's, uh, Dr. Bates had a whole sunning routine that you go from, you know, closed eye sunning to learning to let your eyes be open and, and looking closer to the sun. Um, but I don't want people to be staring at the sun or doing the sun gazing practice that some people recommend. I don't think that's the right thing to do. I, I, I really think you need to, you know, do it in the right gradual way and not push it because if you feel like, hey, I should be able to look directly at the sun, but you're highly myopic or highly presbyopic or you have any kind of eye strain and you look directly in the sun, it's going to add to the strain. And that's not helpful, Mm. right? You want to do only what your eyes are comfortable with when it comes to sunshine. But you want to just sort of invite your eyes to get more and more comfortable every day. And it actually I've had people really, really sensitive to light that within a couple of weeks found they could do most everything without sunglasses. And and it's not hard to come back from that sensitivity. Um, and, and the only you know problem that I still face is all these people have their fears and this indoctrination that says, oh, but UV light is dangerous and causes cataracts. So when I wrote my book, Optimal Eyesight, I thought, well, I better find all the research on this because I don't want to um, say something that's going to damage somebody's eyesight. I want to know the actual research. And then I found that sunlight is actually helpful in cataracts. It's not the other way around. Mm. So the research doesn't prove what the doctors are telling us and what the people selling the sunglasses are telling us. So, you know, because sunglasses are very heavily advertised and it's all about, oh, you got to protect your eyes. But the science doesn't support that. The science actually says the more comfortable you are in light and the more that you can be out there without sunglasses, the healthier your your eyes are going to be. And, And that's, you know, a surprising thing that we ought to be aware of and ought to start implementing new education that says oh sorry you know we had it wrong and this is the better way to keep your eyes healthy definitely uh what about lasik surgery i wanted to ask you about this because i know this is really popular these days and i've heard really mixed results you know some people really love it it's like oh my gosh this changed everything for me other people it's almost like a horror story of dry eyes and pain that can last for years so uh, Mm -hmm. what do you think of lasik oh i hate it (laughs) (laughs) i think it should be avoided completely um But I I do recognize that for some people it has worked. But long term, there tend to be major problems. And for some people, those major problems start right on day one. Um, Whereas for others, it takes a couple of years, five years, 10 years before the problems start. And the reason is that when you do LASIK, um, they do not take away the strain that created your problem in the first place. So your eyes are still under strain, but they've reshaped the cornea, the front part of the eye, to make up for that. It's like etching your prescription on your cornea. Now, how much sense does that make? It's like having permanent lenses there, right? Now, over time, most everybody finds that their prescription changes. It doesn't remain static for the rest of your life. 
most people find that every year, two years, three years, they have a slight change in prescription if they don't change their habits. Usually it gets slightly worse every couple of years. And then they need a different pair of lenses or different pair of glasses. Well, here you are with, with your prescription edged onto your cornea. And now a little bit of blur has happened. And for some who have thick enough corneas, they can consider themselves lucky, in, in quotation marks, and they can go and have a little extra LASIK surgery done mm. to tune it up. But for many, the corneas are by then too thin, and that's not an option. And so they have to then start wearing glasses again. And, and now you have you know, the, the surgically altered lens, or the cornea, and the pair of glasses is back in your life. And you're still susceptible to all the problems that eye strain brings. So to me, it's, you know, it's a silly solution. It's, it's a risky solution. It can be very painful. I've, had, I've dealt with people that come to me as a last resort. They've already had the surgery and they're dealing with all kinds of problems. And now they're like, oh, if only I'd heard of this Bates method before. But, you know, by then it's like, oh, this is already done. We now have to work with what's left. And so I can often help and get rid of what blurry vision has happened since the surgery. And I can even help to some extent with, with reducing the pain and the dryness because often the dryness is just a, a blinking issue where the eyes don't blink enough. So I can you know, help people get back into that better habit so that those kind of problems can go away. But I really, really wish I'd caught them before they went to the surgery because I, I really think it's, it's much healthier to not have your eyes surgically changed and, and then deal with the consequences afterwards. Yeah, that does sound like a much better solution than uh, having your eyeballs lasered. <laughs> I totally think so too. And, uh, but it's amazing how many people do it and, and feel like, you know, for several years, they're very happy with it. Um, and some for many years. And that's, that's great. I'm, you know, it's good for those that, that have the positive results. But there's so many that wish they hadn't done it that I, and, and some of that is not reported. So when you go to, you know, to your laser surgery clinic, that's about to do your laser surgery for you. Um, they don't tell you of the, the number of people and the kind of problems that they have. They kind of downplay it and they say, Oh yeah, you might have some dry eyes for a little while. And you're going, Oh, well, dry eyes for a little while rather than blurry vision for the rest of my life and needing glasses for the rest of my life. That sounds like a fair trade. Right? Mm. And so they sign up for it and get it done and they pay a lot of money to have it done. But if you realize that the risk is actually much more than just possibly some dry eyes for a little while, you might rethink this. And I think you should. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a problem with the medical system in general, just with surgeries as well is, you know, often if you have a bad surgery, they don't want you to come in and they don't want to admit that they messed up. I mean, because there's all that liability and often they'll tell you, well, give it some more time, give it some more time. And it could be a year of giving it more time before you're finally like, wow, that surgery was really a bad idea. But at that point, what recourse do you have? Um, it's just, yeah. you know, you don't. You don't, you can't, there, there is no, they can't reverse it, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and taking them to court, um, yeah, what good does that do to your eyes? That only adds more stress. Yeah. <laughs> so you might end up with some money back if, you know, um, but you have to prove it and, oh my God, the stress of that must be horrendous. Um, so yeah, best to avoid it. And if you've done it and you regret it, then find a good Bates teacher to help you deal with the consequences. Yeah. So what if people do want to learn about the Bates method and, and try this out? What's the best way for them to do it? Okay. If, if you're interested in doing this, I have a, an extensive website called visionsofjoy.org. And uh, on that website, you'll find a huge amount of free information. You'll find a long list of teachers worldwide. 
Um, you'll find books that you can buy. I have written several books myself and, and compiled the best of Bates's materials. So there's a lot of uh, information there that you can easily get. And if you feel like you would really like to be helped by a teacher, find somebody locally, ideally, uh, somebody with some experience and um, go visit them and and get some lessons, get some specific help for your situation. And unfortunately, as, as optometrists are, you know, a, a dime a dozen, is that the expression? Yeah. Um, they're, they're everywhere, right? But Bates teachers are kind of a rare breed. So you may not have somebody in your hometown. And chances are you don't, unless, unless you live in Ohio where I live, <laughs> <laughs> or in one of the probably two, 300 other places where colleagues live. There aren't that many of us. So if you don't have a teacher nearby, either get a book or get a session online if you can't travel to one. But, you know, just get some of this basic information, learn how simple it is and apply it for yourself. See the results and you'll be on the path and you can just keep going for as long as it takes. Because, you know, for some people, like for me, it only took two weeks. For other people, it takes longer if you've got much worse vision than 2050, like you and I have, then it's probably going to take a little longer than two weeks. And you have to just, you know, be okay with that and say, this is a worthwhile investment of my time. Then the more time that you invest, the more you apply these relaxation methods, the sooner you'll have your clarity back. And the sooner you start, the sooner you'll get there. So don't postpone it. Just uh, use this beautiful gift of the lockdown to say hey you know if you're unemployed right now get one of these books and start studying it for yourself and then say this is what i'm going to do until the lockdown is over you'll end up with much better vision yeah can you talk a bit about your books yes um i published one recently called optimal eyesight and that's my main book this is the you know the the one that i've been wanting to write for years and i was very eager to publish um optimal eyesight is a book for the people that deal with eye strain that creates myopia, astigmatism, cross eye, uh, the light sensitivity I discuss in there. Um, the, there's you know all the, the major problems and specifically the ones that have major problems at distance vision. And then I also have a book for the people with the reading glasses, the, the ones that have good vision at distance but need reading glasses to read anything up close. And that book is called Read Without Glasses at Any Age. And uh, that was published in 2013, I think. And then I have a book called Bates Method Nuggets. That was my first uh, published paperback book, which is a compilation of Dr. Bates's most practical advice from the, the 11 years worth of the magazines that he published. Mm. The practical advice in each of those magazines got compiled and printed up in one little booklet um, sorted by topic so it's kind of easier to digest and um, so between those three books it, it covers pretty much everything but if you are interested in specific vision problems I've also got some ebooks on um, just on presbyopia for example one on cataracts um, one on uh, cross eye strabismus kind of problems, and one on nystagmus, one on uh, retinitis pigmentosa, and, and several subjects like that, where I've just compiled Dr. Bates's advice on these issues and put them in one little booklet, so you you don't have to buy all the magazines on the, or his book and then wade through all those many many pages of material to find what's applicable for you and your case. So the, there's plenty of material there if you're interested in in learning by reading. Okay. I, I could keep you busy for a all while. Right, and you can get these on Amazon, I'm assuming. <laughs> yes, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the online bookstores, and on my own website. Great. Yep. I'll have uh, links to those in the show notes. Uh, Esther, I don't really have much else. So, I mean, this was a great subject, something I didn't know anything about. Um, so thanks for coming on. Thank you for inviting me, Lucas. I really enjoyed this. And uh, I hope uh, people will enjoy listening and get something out of it. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Wow. So I have to say that is probably one of the most interesting topics and guests 
that I've had on this podcast, you know, ever. Um, most people, I think, have some type of issue with their vision. And so it really applies to everybody. I was trying to think of anyone I knew who had perfect vision, you know, both near and far. And it's actually really tough to think of anyone who does. I bet if you try to, it might be, you know, just on one hand, you could count the people who have perfect vision. So just to sum up a little bit, Esther, she really focuses on relaxing the eye muscles and letting the eyes do their thing without strain. Uh, I'm recording this summary probably a couple weeks after this interview. Uh, and so I've, I've had a chance to um, try some of these exercises. I actually bought her book and I've, I've read maybe a third of it. Um, and so like I told Esther, my vision is, is slightly blurry. I have, you know, some glasses that are around negative 1.5 diopters. So really not much correction. And so I've been going through her book and doing some of these exercises that she recommends. And I think it's working. You know, I don't, uh, I don't drive at night without glasses, but during the day I've been driving without glasses and it does seem like things are clearer. You know, part, part of what she says is you have to kind of become comfortable with the blur at first. And it's true, you know, back when I just had blurry vision, I would hate the blur. I would like be squinting and, and I wouldn't like it. And becoming comfortable with the blur actually seems to over time make that blur less. Uh, I also noticed walking around during the day, I'm starting to get a little more clarity at times. It is strange. All of a sudden, you know, I'll see something far away very clearly for a moment. And I'll be like, oh my gosh, I can see that. And then it's it's back to the slight blur. So it's, it's almost like my eyes are waking up in a lot of ways. Uh, so I would really recommend her book. Uh, the exercises in there are useful, uh, but but it really is more about how you think about your vision. You know, she's really changed my mind and how you think about how to see well. And, and there is... Uh, there is a skill to seeing well. Uh, It's not just uh, everybody's born able to see, like you you have to be good at it. So, um, and and that involves relaxing. Uh, There's a joy really there too. Uh, When you see clear, you you really do have a joy. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the interview. All the links are in the show notes. Please help me out by shopping through the Amazon banner on our site. It is so easy. You just go to quackspodcast.com and you click the banner. It's on the right. There's a little little pointer that says shop through us. And you go about your normal Amazon purchases. And you know, it helps me out a ton if you get value from these shows. So thank you, my friends, for listening. I'll see you next time. Be well. Be well.